Broomfield, and I'm the vice chair of the Dr. Cog uh, Transportation Advisory Committee. I call the meeting to order uh, for December 19th, 2022 at 1.31. This is uh, in-person and live stream meeting format. F members of the public attending by Zoom may have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that you have typed your name and it reflects your first, last name, and your representation. We ask that those attending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have a technical question, please direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use your raised hand feature to ask any questions or comment on agenda items. Reminder during the business agenda, TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions and members of the public may speak during public comment. Uh, as a reminder to those members and alternates here in person, please make sure the light on your microphone is on when you're prepared to speak and please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify. Uh, we're sending around the sign-in sheet. Please sign in. And at this time, we will do an introduction of the TAC members and alternates present. And uh, we'll start over here. Jeff Dankenbring, representing Arapahoe County from the city of Centennial. Mike Whitaker, city of Lakewood. Matt Callis, Arapahoe County, alternate uh, city of Aurora. Hudson Town of Parker. Alex Hedright, Boulder County. Evan Ash, Town of Frederick, Weld County. Larry Simmons, uh, Senior Special Interest, a little help. Deborah Basket, City of Westminster, and Jeffco Representative. Greenwald, City of Longmont, and Boulder County Representative. Tim Mormon, City of Thornton, and Adams County Representative. Sam Kennedy, Dr. Cog. Sarah Grant, City and County of Brimfield. Hmm. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog. Ron Papsdorf, Dr. Cog. Lisa Wynn, Denver International Airport Alternate. Bill Saroy, uh, Regional Transportation District. Josh Schwenk, Dr. Cog. Jim Kotzer, Arapahoe County, filling in for Brian Weimer. Justin Schmidt, City of Lone Tree, representing Douglas County. Art Griffith uh, with Douglas County. Jennifer Bartlett, City and County of Denver alternate. Rachel Holtine, a non motorized alternate. Jim Eusen, Region 4, CDOT. All right, um, I'll turn it over to Jacob to do an introduction of new members and alternates. Testing. Okay, good. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. <clears throat> uh, a couple of membership and alternate changes to announce, uh, starting with Jefferson County with the departure of our former chair, Steve Durian. Uh, Jefferson County has two new members, uh, Christina Lane from Jefferson County and Maria DeAndre uh, from Wheat Ridge is the new alternate. And then for City County in Denver, we have a new alternate, Jen Bartlett. Welcome, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. We will now uh, move on to public comment. Uh, public comment is limited to three minutes. As a reminder, after public comment period, only TAC members and alternates may partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak after which you will wrap up and, and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, the public comment period uh, after that, only TAC members and alternates will be able to speak in, on the agenda items. Do we have any public comment, either in person or on the phone? Seeing none, none online? Okay, none online. great. We will move on then to our meeting summary. Um, at this time, we will uh, move on to the November 2022 TAC meeting summary. If there's any discussion or corrections or questions about the number, November 14th TAC meeting, um, please let me know. Um, seeing none, then the meeting item will stand. Thank you. And we'll move on to our first action item. I'll turn it over to Jacob. 
Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair. So our first action item today is we need to elect new officers of TAC. As I already mentioned, and as you know, uh, we said goodbye to Steve Durian, our former chair, um, at our November meeting. So we need to elect a new chair um, because our um, the candidate for chair is our current vice chair. We will likely need to elect a new vice chair as well. So we will take these one at a time. As mentioned in the memo that was in the packet, we did a solicitation for candidates uh, for both chair and vice chair. Uh, we also had a nominating panel, and I want to thank those members. Um, they're listed in the memo, but just really briefly, I want to thank Deborah Basket, Alex Hyde Wright, Kent Mormon, Jessica Micklebust, and Rick Pilgrim, who helped kind of work through candidate submissions and the nominating panel came up with a slate of recommended candidates for chair and vice chair to fill the remainder um, of the um, of the term of officers. It's a two-year term, so Steve Durian was um, halfway through um, the two-year term, one year through. So the elections we're going to have today will fill the remainder of the term, which is through the December 2023 meeting. So the nominating panel has recommended the slate of Sarah Grant for chair and Phil Greenwald of Longmont for vice chair. So we're going to take these one at a time, and what we're going to do is for each one, we're going to solicit. There is an opportunity. Um, I will create the opportunity for nominations from the floor, if there are any, uh, for each position. And then depending how that goes, we will either vote by acclamation if there's one candidate or we are prepared to do a Mentimeter vote if we need to do that. So starting with chair, again, the recommended candidate from the nominating panel is Sarah Grant, uh, sitting county of Broomfield, our current vice chair. But I will open it up. Are there any nominations from the floor uh, for another candidate for chair? Combinations, please. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Since we only have one candidate, I'd like to do it by acclamation. So if we could have a sort of friendly uh, revision of that motion to elect a chair by acclamation. Hint, hint. So, so moved. Does the second agree? Second. Okay. All those in favor of electing Sarah Grant as chair by acclamation, please say aye. 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 Great, we have a new chair. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> okay, with our new chair's permission, I will continue the rest of this item. Um, let's do the same thing for vice chair. Let's first open it up. Are there any nominations from the floor for vice chair? All right, I am not seeing any. So can someone give me a motion for acclamation of Phil Greenwald for vice chair? I move by acclamation to nominate Phil Greenwall for vice chair of the TAC. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Great. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of electing Phil Greenwald as vice chair by acclamation, please say aye. Aye. Great. Congratulations to our new officers. Wow. <laughs> and with that, I will turn it back over to our new chair. Thank you, Jacob, and thank you. Uh, we will move on to our action item number five, fiscal year 2022 first year transportation improvement program TIP project delays. Todd Cottrell. Good morning and good morning. Sorry. Good afternoon and thank you. Um, so the adopted TIP policy that we have outlines expectations for the initiation of project delays and project phases, and, and also addresses how we would initiate or how we would go about correcting those issues if they do happen. So these delays, regardless of, of uh, exactly what is happening, um, they, they do tie up the limited resources that we do have um, going towards um, the Dr. Cog allocations. So at the end of federal fiscal year 22 um, in October, Dr. Cog requested from CDOT and RTD to review the status of those projects that had, had FY22 funding. Um, so after working with them and after con confirmation, um, staff contacted the spot project sponsors um, where those project phases were not initiated, initiated and therefore delayed um, to really find out three things. Um, first is to find out the reasons why their identified FY22 phase uh, was not initiated. Um, therefore delayed. Also to discover the current status of that project 
and also to assist them in developing an action plan to go forward um, uh, to, uh, to get that project going. Uh, the attached report summarized the project phases that were delayed as of October 1st. Uh, overall, this report states that 22 projects um, were first year delayed. Um, three of those have already been initiated and are no longer delayed. Uh, one project um, has also canceled their project and returned those funds back to Dr. Cog for reprogramming. Um, so a motion eventually this afternoon uh, to approve staff's recommendation would allow them to continue. So there's a couple other observations about these delays. Um, the number of delayed projects this year is relatively average. Um, the exception is the last few average where um, what we have seen with COVID and staffing changes had really increased those, um, but we are back down to what we would call a relative amount um, considered average. Um, and really in looking into those details as to why they're delayed, um, fairly equal distribution among right-of-way issues, design issues, um, and really sort of a, what we're calling a reduced effort in some of those pre-planning activities that might have happened back when those uh, sponsors CDOT and RTD were working together to really get the project off the ground. Um, so before answering any comments or questions you may have and in introducing uh, a motion, uh, I did want to take a minute and introduce a new member of Dr. Cog's staff, uh, Brad Williams, who is back there. Um, you might have been on a, a call or two with him, but this is his first TAC meeting. Um, but I did want to say that um, part of his job responsibilities will be to take over the project delays process into the future. Um, so the, really the next point of contact that you may have is if you do have a delayed project that's on this list and it continues to be delayed into uh, June of next year, um, you might be hearing from him instead of myself, even though I still will be involved. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are starting to take a more proactive approach and looking at all projects, not necessarily because they're delayed, but really just to make sure that we're in the loop on all aspects, um, certainly make sure that there's a communication between all parties, and we certainly would help to uh, be willing to take that approach and bridge the gap if there happens to be any. So um, starting tomorrow, there will be an email that you might see from Brad that will sort of introduce this topic um, to all of you who have current TIP projects. Um, I think the next step after that is we would certainly like to have some communication with you, whether it's uh, a phone call or a, a Teams or a Zoom meeting um, shortly um, in the first part of next year, um, just some more for introductions, and then also so that um, we can set up a, a monthly reoccurring time um, to discuss your projects, again, even if this is 10 or 15 minutes on a monthly basis, uh, but just to make sure that everyone is working how, how they should and what is supposed to be happening, and that so these projects can continue hopefully these delays will come down in the number. So um, with that, um, happy to take any comments or, or questions you may have. Um, if not, the motion before you is to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the actions proposed by Dr. Cog's staff regarding TIP project delays for federal fiscal year 22. Great, thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Any questions? Seeing none, uh, do we have a motion? I move to recommend to the Transportation or Regional Transportation Committee the actions proposed by Dr. Cog's staff regarding the TIP project delays for fiscal year 2020. Bill, Deborah? Second that. Okay, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Motion passes. Okay, the next item on the agenda, agenda item six, is the Transportation Advisory Committee Chair, um, excuse me, Committee Guidelines. And I'll turn it over to Jacob Rieger. Okay, thank you all very much. Hold on just a second. Okay, hopefully that's better for folks to see. So um, at our, can you all hear me? Okay, at our uh, November meeting, uh, we went through this in some detail, but I know we have a few new faces. So 
The big idea here is that after several years, we're taking a fresh look at our Dr. Cog committee guidelines for several of our committees. Obviously, for us here, we were talking about the TAC portion of our committee guidelines. Uh, we talked through last month, proposed kind of some big ideas, some thematic ideas, talked through those, had a really good informational conversation. We've gone back and made some revisions. Um, so I want to just kind of show you, I don't want to go through it all in great detail again today, uh, but I do want to be transparent and show you the further revisions um, that we've made since the November meeting um, based on our conversation and your input. And then we will be asking for action on this today. Technology. All right, hold on. Okay, so this is the attachment in the memo. Uh, Want to go through a few highlights here. Okay, let's try that. That's better. All right, so in this first section talking about membership, one of the big ideas that we talked about last month, there's really a couple ideas. One is that we would increase for most of our large urban counties uh, the membership from what's currently two members to three members. So that's the first thing that you see, three local government members representing jurisdictions in several of the counties. We did a further clarification, which is one of which would represent the county government and two representing local jurisdictions within each county. The reason for that is just to kind of make clear that you all as TAC members, you're ultimately representing your jurisdictions. One of the big thematic changes that we talked about and what's being proposed here is that the forums, the county sub-regional transportation forums, would now directly appoint you all as members uh, rather than our board chair who currently appoints all of the local government members to TAC. So if you're going to be appointed, if new members are going to be appointed by the forum, we just want to make sure that ultimately at the end of the day, we keep that link to the fact that you are ultimately representing jurisdictions, not just the forum itself. So that's one change that we made. <clears throat> and then let's see. Um, down here, a little bit about local government representatives shall be, we crossed out city or county managers or administrators. That's because I think we've only had one in the almost 10 years that I've been doing this. So the point is that we want people who can represent your jurisdictions, people with enough seniority and authority that you can speak on behalf of your jurisdiction. But in our mar modern world, we understand that we all have different titles and different classifications. So we've changed the language here just a little bit to make clear that we're looking for either public works, transportation, planning directors, managers, or other senior level staff um, in terms of the local government members for TAC. So really just kind of not changing the intent, um, but just clarifying a little bit, maybe some titles or classifications of the folks who actually do serve on TAC. Um, let's see, coming down here a little bit, when we get to the special interest seats, uh, we currently have seven special interest seats. We did propose a couple more last month. We also had a conversation around a couple of those in particular. One current special interest seat is Denver International Airport. Another is VIA. We talked about last month whether both of those entities are so large and so sort of complex and meaningful to the region. Should they get their own direct seat on TAC or should they be a special interest? based or say as a special interest seat. Based on the feedback that you gave us, what we did here, what we're proposing is that VIA Mobility would be a direct seat um, on TAC, like some like CDOT or some of our other members, but we would keep Denver International Airport um, as a special interest seat. Uh, we also corresponded with folks from DEN, D-E-N, who clarified that they work very closely with the general aviation airports in our region and can help kind of represent their interests and their activities as well if the committee decides to, to stick with this approach. Uh, we are still proposing two special interest seats. One of the other pieces of feedback, uh, we talked about the older adult seat and the equity seat. Uh, we heard from you all last month that older adults, and we're using that term, that's the term that we use as opposed to senior, um, but that the older adult seat is important enough that should stay its own special interest seat. So we're proposing to keep that, but we are proposing to add um, down here at the top of the second page, an equity population, marginalized communities, that's kind of the terms that we're using in our equity analysis, a seat that would represent equity interests in the region, as well as a housing seat. And as a reminder, housing, we're sort of keeping that very open. Housing means a lot of things, but in the bipartisan infrastructure law, there is additional language around the linkage between MPO transportation planning and housing. Um, so we thought we wanted to reflect that um, in terms of one of our special interest seats. 
And then just a couple more things um, under the appointment and selection of members and alternates. One of the things we talked about last month, obviously a big change is that we're proposing the county sub-regional transportation forums would directly appoint the local government members, as I said, instead of the board chair who does that today. We're also further proposing here that this, the forums would appoint alternates. And the idea there would be that both members and alternates would come from the forum. Today, when, when our board chair appoints a member, the member appoints the alternate, and that alternate is tied to that specific member. So you all, as members, have specific alternates. Here, the idea would be we'd loosen that up just a little bit. The forum would appoint, per on the first page, three members per most counties. So there'd be three members and three alternates, and the forum would just appoint those six people per county, and there would be a little bit of flexibility between uh, the relationship between the members and the alternates. So that's one further change that we made. Um, and then I think two more changes. Oh, down here under use of alternates, this first section that we crossed out, um, again, with this change of the forum directly appointing members and alternates, this is really just kind of redundant language. Um, today, you all work through me, um, and I'm your liaison to our board chair who directly appoints members. So the language here originally was, hey, you need to notify me and work through me. Obviously, if the forms are doing that directly, that's not needed now. So that's why that's crossed out. Um, finally, I think two more things on the top of this third page. We found ourselves in this position about 20 minutes ago, so we thought, hey, we ought to account for the fact that on the rare occasion when we need to um, elect new officers kind of midterm as we did today, why don't we actually put that in our bylaws and formalize what we just did? So that change is there. And then finally, based on all of these changes, um, particularly with the special interest seats, the increase of local government members for most urban counties, um, it changes our membership, so we redid the calculations here. Um, it would be 20 voting members or designated alternates would now represent a quorum based on the changes contemplated in the bylaw in the committee guidelines here. And then 20 affirmative votes are required to carry any action based on the fact that TAC with these changes would now increase to 39 members. So I think I've touched on just about everything um, that we that we uh, talked about last month. Ron, was there anything else you wanted to mention? Yeah, thanks, Jacob. I just wanted to note that we did get one uh, proposal from a member of TAC um, requesting the addition of language to the TAC guidelines, allowing any member to attend up to six meetings virtually, um, or and um, if they had a medical condition through the chair to attend all meetings virtually. Um, the, the time, manner, place, attendance for uh, the, the committee meetings really isn't within the purview of TAC, so we're not including that in these guidelines. Uh, we did talk to our executive director. Uh, he, he's gonna talk to our executive committee. Our board has been pretty clear with us about their intent around standing committees meeting in person when it's safe to do so. Um, they're, they're holding their meeting, their regular meetings once a month in person as well. Uh, we don't have a good venue or a good setup for hybrid meetings to have some, some people attending in person, some attending virtually. Uh, so again, sort of not the preview of TAC to decide sort of the time, manner, place for meetings. Uh, very much appreciate that feedback. Um, and so I just wanted to note that since we did get that, get that comment um, into us, just so you all, and um, I think that was the only other. So we'd be happy to answer any additional questions, um, but with these changes, we are asking for a motion um, to approve these revisions to the Dr. Cog Committee guidelines dealing with the Transportation Advisory Committee. Just to clarify, recommending approval, not the tax not approving the guidelines. Yes, recommending so, approval to our Regional Transportation Committee. Yes, thank you. Uh, quick question. Um, how many people do we have here today? I'm wondering if we're going to lose quorum if this is approved. Well, we wouldn't lose quorum. It's not official until our board approves it, okay. which they'll do um, sometime early next year. So. Recommending approval today doesn't instantly change our okay. form, but thank you for thank you for noting that. <laughs> That's important. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Papsdorf. Uh, any additional questions, uh, Mr. Mormon? Uh, thank you. Um, is there a reason why we're doing twenty? Uh, board has a quorum of a third. I'm just curious why we would not reasoning. Not disagreeing. 
Well, let me answer the first part of the question. We, as our current committee guidelines have been uh, for TAC, a quorum has been basically 50% plus one. So it's just a majority of, of members. And so I've kept that math in these revisions. Um, but Ron, I don't know if you want to address any differences with the board, but. I can't, I can't, that predates my time at Dr. Cog, so I can't speak to the rationale behind the difference. We, our proposal was to sort of keep the same policy language that's in the guidelines, which is if we're increasing the members that the quorum should be 50 plus one. I think it's to make sure that since, since uh, TAC membership doesn't represent every single jurisdiction around the region like the board does, um, and that sort of you're representing local government members. I think the intent was if you're making recommendations on important regional transportation decisions, it ought to represent a pretty pretty significant majority of the members of the committee. And um, just to answer that previous question, we have 19 uh, alt uh, TAC members or alternates present today. But voting alternates. Vol voting alternates. Thank you. <laughs> Whoop, Mr. Greenwald. I'm um, just wondering if staff sees, if Dr. Cog's staff sees any lack of nim or, or loss of nimbleness as far as replacement of of members. We seem to be fairly quick and agile at this point to get people in and out. And you know how Boulder County can sometimes be with kind of go in there and take people off. But um, just wondering if you see any issues with that going to a sub regional forum now where it's more formalized. We have to have that meeting set. It's elected officials. Yeah, no, that's a really good question, and, and thank you for um, bringing up that aspect of it. Um, yes, you're right. Today in our current process where the board chair um, ultimately appoints that member. However, in recent years, my practice has been in sort of administering this committee that when there is a vacancy, I go to the forum anyway. I don't ask for a vote, um, but the forum is the place where we, you all work together to build consensus, and what I always want to bring to our board chair is a consensus candidate. So it is, in a sense, formalizing what I do already, but with the added twist of yes, a vote. I would say that's mitigated a little bit. I think it's a fair point, Phil, and everyone. I think it's mitigated a little bit by increasing the membership for most of the counties that at any given time right now, if you have a vacancy, that's one, I guess, one-fourth of your membership per you know sort of geographic county. Now it would be one-sixth. So the impact would be just a little bit less and I think would hopefully give some time for the next time the forum meets to, um, to make a vote. Um, but it's a fair point. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Jacob, is it is it uh, accurate to uh, interpret this as effective date would be Q? So, yeah, the effective date will be um, when our board adopts the all of the changes to the Dr. Cog committee guidelines that are being contemplated, and it's more than just TAC. We're taking this time to kind of look at all of our committees and make similar types of revisions. So the board is expected to do that sometime in the first part of early next year once we gather all of the different committee changes, uh, revisions together. So whenever that is early next year, that's when it would take effect when the board takes that action. Whole team? Oh, sorry, Mr. Heidreich. Uh, question about the alternates. I'm not sure I understand how those work. So with the move to larger county jurisdictions to one representative from a county, from a municipality, would the alternates also be one from a county and two from a municipality, or is it just three representatives from any jurisdiction and then absent, does that impact who could be an alternate? Yeah, it's more the second thing you said, Alex. That's a good question. So we do want to be intentional on the members. We want to be clear that one from a county government and two from local governments for members. For alternates, I think we're being a little more flexible here and just saying, you know, under this proposal, the forums would just appoint three alternates. It doesn't have to be the same one and two. It could just be, you know, however that would work with the forums. Um, so we want to loosen that up a little bit. And also, as I said, we'd loosen a little bit right now. Um, your alternates are attached to you directly as members. So like Alex, you have a specific alternate. Under this proposal, again, say for Boulder County, you'd have three members and three alternates and there'd be some flexibility about the relationship of the alternates to the members. Does that make sense? Okay. Ms. Hilting. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, so I have a question about voting and non-voting members. So just for clarification, am I correct that the special interests are non-voting members? No, they are voting members. They are voting members. They are okay. voting. And uh, who is non-voting members? Um, at least our federal agency partners. I actually have to come back and look, but at least those folks. And we specify that here. Yeah, it's just the um, our our uh, stakeholders from our Federal Highway and Federal Transit Administration are the two non-voting members. Okay, th this is just a really uh, unlikely scenario, but um, when you have a quorum of 20 and a minimum of 20 people for something to vote, you could be in a situation where you have a quorum of 20 but only 18 voting members. Um, that makes does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, it does. No, that's a good point. Again, I think the thought there, both on the quorum side and the voting side, let's take quorum first. Obviously, we want a majority of members present for quorum if we stick with the same sort of 50% plus one, right? On a voting, um, the idea would be that we want kind of the same thing. We want a majority of TAC membership to approve something. So we don't, you know, we don't want to get in a situation where kind of what you just laid out, that if we have 20 people who show up, um, so we've barely got a quorum and then something passes like, you know, 12 to eight or whatever, right? So we want to we want to make sure, I could have said this more elegantly, for both the quorum and for to pass a vote, we want to make sure it's a majority of our TAC membership. And that's why it's written the way it is to reflect a majority um, plus one of our actual TAC membership. Yeah, just, just to follow up, um, Rachel, I, I think we, we did the math, I believe correctly, I'm not a math, I wasn't a math major, so no guarantees, but I'm, I, I believe we did the math correctly. The quorum and the voting numbers are based on the voting members. We did not count the two ex officio seats in calculating but the 50% plus one sort of quorum. I don't think we'd run into that situation. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I understand process. Uh, can members of this body add language uh, at this point to be forwarded on? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is an action item. So if there um, is a proposed sort of change or amendment to this. Is it appropriate to make a motion at this time to add language then? Are there additional questions or comments? Uh, sounds like we have a couple more. Uh, one more question on the quorum and the motion carrying. So if we have the quorum minimum of 20, and we have a 19 to one vote to pass something, does it not pass then? That would be correct. Any further questions, comments? We have a motion. Thank you. Uh, after the after the paragraph on quorum and voting, I would like to insert the following language. Committee members may participate in up to six meetings per year remotely. Members with health, accessibility, or other concerns who wish to participate in additional meetings remotely may request the ability to do so from the chair. Um, I get po point of order. I'm not sure. Are, can we vote on that? Madam Chair, it's re it's really not in tax purview to add language into the guidelines related to how the how the committee meetings are are held or attendance at the. I believe we just discussed the quorum rules for several minutes. I am uh, pointing out who would be included in quorum. Madam Chair, I've, I've spoken to the executive director. This is this is at the board's discretion. I've already indicated our, our executive director is going to have a conversation with our executive committee of our board of directors. Sounds like that um, the proposed motion um, is not within the purview of TAC to vote on. Uh, would you like to keep your motion on the floor or withdraw? I'd like to keep it on the floor, please. Do I have a second? No, many of you don't know me. I'd ask for a second to have the opportunity to explain, please. God, if you feel my rationale isn't reasonable. Uh, I see Alex Hybrid. I'm in support of 
I guess wanting to second if possible, because uh, I'm in support of the concept. I guess not entirely sure how to express my support. Um, that is something that's outside of tax purview. I guess it's my understanding that we're making a recommendation anyway, so we're not we are not the deciding body on these. So I guess I'm a little unclear on how making a recommendation as the motion does is outside of our purview. Abster? Is that a second to the motion, Alex? Oh, yes. Look, I, I don't I don't know how many more times I can say it. I've spoken to the executive director. We we believe that the time, place, manner of a Dr. Cog committee meeting um, that's established under guidelines adopted by the board uh, is the purview of Dr. Cog and not of TAC itself. Um, so um, from our perspective, it's not appropriate for TAC to add this kind of language. Um, that's from a from a kind of a policy standpoint. From a practical standpoint, we just don't believe, we do not believe it's feasible to have hybrid meetings that are effective, uh, where some members are participating in person, some are virtual uh, by allowing members to attend um, up to six meetings virtually. If someone has a documented medical condition and they need some special accommodation, we will accommodate people's individual needs. Uh, we, we are a public agency. Uh, we take pride in our accommodation efforts and our compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so if there's a, an accommodation needed for a member, we can have that conversation. We don't believe this language belongs in the guidelines, and we don't believe the board would approve it, and we don't think it's appropriate for TAC to include that in their recommendation. Thank you. And I think, Mr. Griffith, do you have a question or comment? I can appreciate the concern. But I feel that if um, subregions are allowed even more than three alternatives, I think that there's an opportunity for discussions to occur internally with the organizations for various reasons. And someone from that organization as an alternate could represent that person in voting, even though maybe a key player can't be present. Any other discussion? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to explain a little bit uh, why I um, may seem a little insistent on this. Um, and th th there's a number of factors. One, um, you know, many of our organizations focus on, uh, obviously, we're, we're focused on transportation. We're focused on um, uh, quality of life and air quality. Um, and uh, requiring in-person meetings encourages people to be driving more. Um, requiring in-person meetings um, does not uh, is not in line with the trip reduction efforts that many of us um, work on. Um, and I think first and foremost, this is a living our values sort of um, idea. This uh, is living our values in terms of allowing more people from disadvantaged communities um, who have disabilities and others to participate when transportation may be a challenge to them. Um, so at a large level, I think this is a good policy for more organizations to be adopting. Um, since this has uh, come up and um, been rejected a few times, I, I will say personally, I'm one of only two director level positions at the Regional Air Quality Council besides our executive director. Um, I. I don't feel it's appropriate for me to have to send a junior level staff member to represent me um, if I am not comfortable for health concerns being present here. Um, and I think it's an incredibly reasonable request to allow people to participate remotely. We do allow people to participate remotely in these meetings. We have public comment remotely. And I I think it's um, completely in line um, as we're discussing what constitutes uh, being present for um, voting purposes. So that's my rationale and um, thank you for considering it. Further discussion? Dorf? David, I appreciate your perspective and, I, and I've heard you and I understand it. Um, I do. Um, I think on the on the transportation side and living our values, I think it's a it's a little bit of a red herring issue. Um, we're talking about one meeting a month. Uh, we 
the assumption that the only alternative to getting to this meeting is by driving in a car by yourself, I think is false and, and, under, and undervalues the transportation system we have in this region. Um, there are transit options, there are bike options, uh, there are carpool options, there are plenty of other options other than just driving to get to this meeting if, if that's the concern. Um, and, and, I, so, and we're talking one meeting a month for this group. Um, I, 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 don't know, I don't know, maybe I'm an outlier, but when I participate in a meeting virtually, especially a large meeting like this, especially a meeting where some people are in person, some people are remote, the level of interaction and engagement and discussion uh, in that meeting is very different. And maybe I'm the only one that is also keeping an eye on their email and checking email and maybe working on this document that I have a deadline to do. Um, maybe even taking an urgent phone call or a phone call that I think is urgent and sort of half paying attention to the meeting. I may be the only one. If I'm the only one, shame on me. Um, but I, I have experienced when we've had these meetings in person, the level of engagement, the level of dialogue, the level of participation is much different and being able to see everyone eye to eye understand their reactions, their engagement in that discussion is very, very different. Um, and this committee makes very, very important decisions for this. So from a practical standpoint, I just, I don't, I don't agree with some of your premises. Um, we have expanded and we did learn some really good lessons during the pandemic about access to this meeting and broadening access for our public to participate and monitor our meetings. That's why we have continued to live stream our meetings out to the public. So the public can participate and watch the meetings, watch the proceedings. And for public comment, absolutely, we allow the public to make public comment virtually um, at these meetings because it doesn't make a lot of sense to force someone to come down here for a three minute comment. I believe it does make sense to have members of this committee come to the, come to the meeting and participate in the meeting for a two-hour meeting and a two-hour dialogue about important decisions. That's different than sort of the public being able to offer you public testimony uh, via, via Zoom in a time slot. I, I, I've heard you. I'm sorry to disagree, David. Again, um, we don't believe this is the purview of the TAC. Any further discussion? I think we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Well, I, I think, I believe so. As a point of order, we do have a motion on the floor and a second. Correct. Uh, Alex. See if I can get my mic working. Uh, sorry, I thought that our motion and second was invalid. Um, I have a friendly amendment to what I thought was going to be another motion forthcoming. For uh, the non-RTD representative of transit services seat on TAC and advocating for that in addition to VIA seat and want to make my case that just as active transportation, environmental interests, freight, several of the other special interest seats are of great importance to the region, so too is transit. Um, it's pretty clearly enshrined in RTD's plans and in our RTP and would like to advocate for having a non-governmental transit voice on TAC uh, through you know, the special interest seat. I wonder if you should ask on the guidelines themselves and take that and then you can. Thank you. Um, so we, uh, as Mr. Papsdorf uh, has advised, uh, we will take um, a vote uh, first on the uh, uh, TAC committee guidelines as proposed, and then we will take amendments to those guidelines. So we'll take a motion on the guidelines and then we'll take a, a motion on any additional amendments. Uh, I think I saw uh, Mr. Griffith. I'm not big on the Roberts rules completely, but yeah. do we have to address, uh, there was a, a second on his, don't we need to do that first or not? I mean, yeah, I, 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 would, I would suggest to the committee, maybe just take a step back, get a, get a, get a main motion on the table first on the guidelines, take the, take, the amendment, take the amendment motions, and then you can take votes on the amendment motions once there's no more amendments, and then 
once those amendments have been decided, then you could take a vote on the. On so with that comment, Ron, then I would make a motion. Basic. And the, just to clarify, uh, the motion is to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the proposed amendments to the TAC section of the Dr. Cog Committee guidelines. Hmm. Yes. All right, I'm actually just also a little confused in process. It, it would be normal to finalize all of the language before forwarding it on, or am I not understanding something here? David, my suggestion usually usually that happens. There's a there's a there's a main motion on the package, and then amendments to the motion. I, I would suggest that you, your original motion probably is better suited as an, an amendment. I understand. So we're not going to do a vote before amendments. Correct. Thank you. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor. Alex. So I'll restate my amendment to restore the non-RTD representative of transit as a special interest seat on tech. Actually, I'll suggest first that we need a second on the main motion, and then we'll go into amendments. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so can we have a second on the main motion, and then we will take amendments? Thank you. I'll, I'll second. All right. Okay, thank you, Bill. I have a motion and a second on the proposed committee guidelines. Um, all in favor? Don't move. So we've got a main motion. Let's let's. I would suggest we we had a we had a motion and a second. Let's let's just accept that that was a an amendment motion. And then I think Alex wants to make a, a second amendment motion. So after you've got all the amendments on the table, we'll then that. we'll take votes on the amendments. And then once the amendments have been acted on, you can go to the final to the main motion. Okay. Thank. You. So um, I think we had a. First uh, suggested amendment. Okay. So we'll take the. Can you please restate your amendment? Thank you. Um, after the paragraph on quorum and voting, I would like to insert the following language. Committee members may participate in up to six meetings per year remotely. Members with health accessibility or other concerns who wish to participate in additional meetings remotely may request the ability to do so from the chair. Thank you for the proposed amendment. Um, we, can you state your name, please? David Sabato, representing the Regional Air Quality Council. Thank you. And um, do we have any other amendments? We have Mr. Hyde Wright also has a recommended amendment. Alex Hyde Wright, Boulder County, third time's a charm. Um, <laughs> I'd like to have an amendment to uh, remove the strike through of a non RTD representative of transit, cert, of transit interest in the special interests uh, section to restore that membership to the special interests of tech. Madam Chair, sorry, just clarification on that particular motion, Alex. So just to make sure we're understood, non-RTD transit today is a special interest seat. This proposal would be to elevate via mobility as a direct seat on TAC and therefore take it out of the special interest seat realm. So is your motion that we'd have via mobility as a direct seat but also add back a non-RTD transit special interest seat? Yes. Okay. Ms. Basket? I have a question for Jacob. So the list of representatives is, includes a non-motorized transportation. It reads really strangely, actually, non-motorized transportation something. Um, is that the intention? Represent any non uh, single occupant folks? No. So on that one, the intention. Let me find that here. All right, hold on. I want to have it up on the screen for you all. Yeah, there it is. So we split. So today, one of our seven special interests is a shared seat between TDM, transportation demand management, and non-motorized, meaning anything without a motor, active transportation, bicycling, walking, rolling, et cetera. So one change that we talked about last month was to split that seat um, and create special interest seat for each of those. So a TDM seat and a non-motorized seat. 
that seat, Deborah, would not be a transit seat per se. It would be an active transportation seat. And the idea was that both of those topics, TDM and non-motorized, are important enough in our work that they should have their own seat. Say active transportation. If you're being, we debated that, and and if someone wants to make that amendment, the only reason we didn't put active transportation, and I'll take responsibility, the only reason I didn't do it is because that is. That is an accepted but not universal term across the country and in this region. Some folks just say non-motorized. That's really what it is. Active transportation, a lot of people know, but not everyone uses that term or understands it. Versus hopefully non-motorized, we understand anything without a motor. That was the only logic there. Any additional amendments? Okay. And uh, Mr. Heidright? I would propose amending the non-motorized to active transportation. Oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Heidright, we'll need a second on your first proposed motion. Uh, do we have a second before we move on to your second proposed motion? Second it. Sorry, who said that? Thank you, Mr. Sabato. Um, and then uh, Mr. Heidright had a second proposed amendment uh, to change non-motorized to active transportation. Do we have a second? Second. Ms. Holteen, thank you. Any additional proposed amendments? Okay, so um, what we will do is take a vote on the amendments um, in reverse order is received. So the first or the last one we just got for the active transportation. Um, all in favor? Are we are we going to take hand counts? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So raise your hand. Hi. Count one. Okay, so raise your hand nice and high, and we'll go around and please state your name. Mr. Heidright. Alex Heidright. Deborah Basket. Bill Greenwald. Lisa Wynn. Rachel Holteen. Mr. Sabato. Mr. Sabato. Excuse me. We have six in favor. The proposed. You need 15 to pass, so the proposed motion does not pass. On the um, second proposed motion regarding transit by Mr. Heidright, um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Um, I'll call on you to state your name. So I'll start in the back, um, Mr. Heidright. Alex Heidright. Trevor Basket. Phil Greenwald. Rachel Halting. Jim Bartlett. Dave Sabados. I do not believe we have 15 to pass that. Um, and then the first proposed motion by Mr. Sabato uh, for the uh, re remote attending. Please raise your hand if uh, you're in favor of the proposed motion or proposed amendment. So we'll go around the room the, the same way. Um, Mr. Alex Hadright. Red basket. Hold. The win. Jen Bartlett. Yes, Sabados. Uh, the motion does not pass. And then the first proposed motion, which was to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee um, 
back section of the Dr. Cog committee guidelines. Uh, all in favor? And <laughs> okay, um, we'll go around the room and call. We'll call out names. Mr. Dickenbridge. Alex Hadright. Kevin Ash. Robert Basket. Phil Greenwald. Kent Mormon. Ron Pastor. Win. Phil Saroy. Jim Houston. Rachel Haltine. Jen Bartlett. Art Griffith. Justin Schmitz. Yes, who else? Mr. Spears, is that yes? Yes. And Sarah Grant. I do believe that was uh, more than 15. Oh, that does pass. Thank you. Any uh, yes, uh, any no's? Please raise your hand. No, I'm seeing no. Oh. I'm sorry, do we have a question or discussion? <laughs> Mr. Griffith? I think this has been an interesting conversation and I appreciate everybody. But, um, but I wanted to say that Ron did express, and that influenced my voting, uh, that they will always treat each they can. I think that's important to make sure we pass. Hey, thank you. Thank you for that discussion. Much appreciated. Thank you all. You need to have the people who abstained as part of. I'm sorry. Um, do we have any? I'm sorry. Uh, no's or abstentions? I think we did the no's. Do we have any abstentions? For the vote? I think you're seeing none. Okay. Um, we will move on to our next item, item number seven Transportation Planning Framework. Uh, Matthew Helfand. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner. So, so uh, I, we brought this to you guys uh, last month, uh, but uh, and a lot of this is going to be review, but wanted to go over it a little bit again. Um, the framework is uh, used to be known as the perspective. It provides detail on how regional transportation planning in the Denver region is conducted, and it outlines the roles of CDOT, RTD, and Dr. Cog. The purpose of the document is to describe policies and procedures, uh, detail how Dr. Cog, uh, CDOT, and RTD cooperate, identify key regional uh, transportation planning products. Oh. Oh, sure. Right. Uh, identify uh, key regional transportation planning project, uh, products and uh, show how the regional planning process fits together with various um, uh, government uh, entities and, and other, um, and uh, reference in, it's also referenced in the MOA, uh, Memorandum of Understanding for Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. And I'll go into that further in a minute. So elements, um, there's there's a few key chapters in in this in this document. Um, policy direction, uh, Dr. Cog uh, committees and public and stakeholder engagement, planning process products, and coordination with other transportation pro uh, processes. So um, highlights of, of what's new since the last time. Uh, Greenhouse gas rules, obviously. Uh, Senate Bill uh, 21260, uh, front range passenger rail, and also um, the new, uh, the, 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 the latest surface uh, transportation authorization bill. So uh, there are just a few minor updates since the last time you saw this. Uh, and uh, we strategically placed this, uh, this item right after the previous item uh, because we're, we made the language more flexible so that um, at any time that committee guidelines get um, amended, 
um, that we don't have to amend this document as well. And uh, the next step after adoption of the framework document is that um, we're going to uh, uh, go, uh, we're going to have a memorandum of agreement uh, with RTD, CDOT, and Dr. Cog, uh, agreeing, essentially agreeing to the rules and uh, uh, all the policies and procedures in the framework document. And there's a reference to the framework document in the memorandum of agreement. And so the proposed, proposed motion is moved to recommend the Regional Transportation Committee approval of the Transportation Planning Framework document. I'll take any questions if you have. Thank you, Mr. Halfont. Do we have any questions? Mr. Griffith? Um, does the Front Range Rail ever present to the Technical Advisory Committee? I mean, it's it's... It's kind of like, I'm not sure where it's at when I'm asked, you know. So I was just wondering if that is something formally that they could um, check in. And I don't know if formally is quarterly or twice a year or something like that. Yeah, thanks for that question. Or just to answer it, um, in the previous iteration, when it was the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission, uh, we did have several presentations to the Dr. Cog board over the five or six years of that commission. Um, didn't have them present to TAC, but they did present to the board. Now that commission, due to state legislation, Senate Bill 238, I believe, um, has reconstituted as the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. Um, they've been meeting since May. So they've been in about six months or so, and they're still kind of getting themselves kind of formed and kind of worked up. So I think when they get to a little bit more solid point, I'm happy to take that to them and just see, hey, can we, you know, and they will have a robust public outreach, but I think that's a good idea. So when they're at a little bit more solid footing, we can certainly talk about them coming to TAC. No questions or comments? Uh, is there a motion? Griffith? I'll make a motion. Recommend. I don't have my glasses on, so <laughs> move, move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee approval of the transportation planning framework document. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Mr. Mr. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any aye. no's? Any abstentions? Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to the next section that concludes all of our uh, action items for the day. We're going to move on to the um, informational briefing section of the agenda. Uh, item number eight, the annual report on traffic congestion in the Denver region. Uh, Robert Spots, Program Manager, Mobility Analytics. Good afternoon. I'm Robert Spots. Uh, I manage the Mobility Analytics Program here at Dr. Cog. And today I'm kind of going to be like the uh, ghost of Christmas past and see how you all behaved in 2021. Uh, especially early 2021 feels like a really long time ago now, a very different world we were living in at that time. So we'll go through, through some of that traffic observations from then. We'll look towards the future or, um, and what we know about the 2050 plan and congestion then, and then just some general mitigation approaches. So... Um, here's kind of the history of VMT. You've, uh, we do this every year. Um, I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, but, you know, from 2000 to about 2006, VMT and before then, VMT had been on a very steady increase. Um, starting in 2006, right before that recession started, VMT really did not grow that year. And really throughout that entire recession, even though population continued to grow in the region, VMT did not really um, increase. After we were coming out of the the Great Recession, there was a pretty large increase, a steep increase in VMT. But then we started leveling out again, like it was like a course correction from then of some type. But then in 17, 18, 19, it started to level out again and was pretty flat. In fact, in, in 2019, when we were doing this report, we said there was a 0% growth in VMT. Again, the region continued to grow. So the population was up. Um, obviously, in 2020, a very large decrease. Um, over the year as a whole, we estimated about a 15% decrease. Um, and in 2021, the year started off pretty slow, but we got a little bit more back to 2019 levels um, towards the end of the year. 
Dr. Cog is estimating about a 3% decrease from 2019 overall. Um, so that's you know a pretty big bounce back from that 15% down in 2020. As I said, population continued to grow in the region through all of this at a pretty reliable clip. And so even though VMT um, you know, bounced back up, um, VMT per capita kind of tells a different story. So we really did continue to grow through all of this. And our VMT per capita rate was still pretty far down um, through all these um, years past 2010, but it's, even in 2021, um, VMT per capita um, did not bounce back as much because the population continued to grow. We are now above, back above our MetroVision target of 2023, though, of, of that, that we meet, we met in 2020. So, I'm going to go through the year. Um, just a reminder that in early 2021, not many people were vaccinated. Um, then broad vaccinations became available, kind of around May and June of um, 2021. And correspondingly, you saw some people going back to work, returning to kind of normal activity. And you see VMT, um, this is just kind of an example, um, automated traffic quarter station. But you got basically even above 2019 towards the end of the year um, at this particular location. And then again, a reminder, in November and December, that's when we had some weather, but also the Omicron variant really, um, its head surfaced. And that's when people, masking policies went back. People started um, not going into work again as much. So things changed again towards the end of the year. Um, there's another example station with a very similar pattern, but we wanted to talk about how there's, we mentioned this last year too, but there, there has been some pretty significant variation around the region. So um, on a, a quarter like US 36, the station's at McCaslin. This quarter happens to carry a lot more office commuter type of people. And so a lot of those people continued to um, work from home more than um, other areas like commercial areas like um, near Commerce City at I-270 and York, which really never reached those large decreases the entire year. And um, even in December, you know, was really stayed at 2019 levels. So it just shows how different roadways um, around our region are used for different purposes. There's different land uses and travel behavior associated with all of those. So even though we're telling a big regional picture here, there's obviously very unique stories on every roadway in every community, on every facility. Um, just a look at how um, travel occurred throughout the day. So this is um, three years in April. So yellow is 2019. That was kind of like pre-COVID, the normal. You've got your big AM peak, a little bit of lull in the midday, a big PM peak. Um, in 2020, that really flattened out. There was not really those big peaks in the morning, obviously much lower activity overall. In April 2021, you know, the, the midday and PM peak were relatively similar to 2019, but that AM, P, AM peak did not, um, you know, get back to 2019 levels. And we see a very similar story, October 2020, it was getting back more towards normal. But even in October of 2021, still that AM peak was below. And I, I, I'm just anecdotally, we haven't seen too much data for 2022, but I still feel like that AM peak is not quite as severe as it used to be around the region and, again, in certain locations. I'm just telling some other stories of what happened last year in other modes. So this is transit, you know, this is again an example station that the 2019 baseline is in gray there. An example, um, VMT at a, at a traffic volumes at a station, huge dip in April of 2020, and then that slow gradual kind of increase back to, to basically 2019 levels by the end of 2021. Transit did not have that same um, recovery. Um, you know, there's still, ridership is still significantly down. RTD is obviously in the process of reimagining themselves, adapting to the new situation, figuring out how to get ridership back. Um, we love getting this data from Lisa. Lisa, we really appreciate this Pena data. It's very cool. And, you know, it did this Pena is such a unique um, road, again, unique geography, really associated with those airport trips, especially at the station, which is east of V470, so really getting towards the airport. You can just see how those trips at the airport are so closely associated with traffic volumes on that road, not quite back up to 2019 levels still. This is some new data we have. It's really neat. We, um, we've coordinated with our local governments and uh, the micro-ability operators around the region. In fact, we won an award for gathering this data from um, the American, or American Association of MPOs. Did I say that wrong? What is that? AMPO. Close enough. AMPO. So this is uh, 2020, um, 2019 data. You can see this is, this is really when it was really starting to kick off scooters and bikes around the region. Big peaks in the summer. 
um, relative to the cold times. I rode my bike this morning. It is not pleasant to ride micromobility at this time of year. Uh, <laughs> In 2020, you know, it, it was obviously huge growth in that early part of the year relative to 2019. Um, and then, you know, April, obviously not when that was the peak of the pandemic. But even in May of 2020, really like the heart of the pandemic, there were still micro, more micromobility trips than in 2019. That's when we were really, really into sanitizing everything and not being around. So you can see even throughout, the, throughout 2020, through the whole pandemic, um, you know, micromobility trips were pretty much up in the region. And then we have 2021 data, so obviously really large growth um, in micromobility trips in the Denver region. It'd be interesting to see the 22 data and beyond. All right. So talking about 2050, we're still telling a very similar story with a lot of growth in the region. Not as much growth as 2019 to 2020, uh, but a, over a million more people in the region by 2050. And so there's a there's a bunch of statistics that we can say to scare you about how bad congestion is going to be. This is one of the, one of the scariest ones, but congestion is bad in two o'clock in the afternoon. This is five today. So a lot more severity and congestion. Um, there's a whole table in the, in the report, which you all have a copy of. Um, it's in your agenda. Oops. Um, that tells a lot of stories about how expensive it's going to be about how much more severe it's going to be. Um, but there are some things we can do about it. Also included is the map. We provide this every year. In red are the segments we consider uh, severely congested in 2021. And in orange, the segments we anticipate to be in congested in one scenario of the future, our current predicted scenario of the future by 2050. So pretty large expansion of those roadways that experience a lot of the magnitude, the duration, the severity of congestion. Um, so... Just want to say that that you know there's con congestion uh, mitigation. The program often gets associated with freeway expansions or roadway capacities. We're just highlighting in this report just some alternate ways of of mitigating congestion and avoiding congestion, alleviating congestion. This um, we just wanted to highlight this project because it just opened up and it's it's such a neat project where that yellow line you can see uh, on a bike path, the Highland Canal. Um, users used to have to cross at grade Colorado there and also Hamden. Um, to get through this intersection. And this new um, paved trail, partially funded with Dr. Cog funds, does an underpass under Colorado and Hamden. It's just really neat looking out there. And you can just see how safe these kids are crossing the road. And you all know this, but, you know, just the bike, having good, safe facilities like this allow users to, you know, adapt to congestion by either just not being on the road, avoiding it. And when they're off the road, avoiding that congestion, they're also helping others um, to uh, alleviate congestion by uh, having less vehicles on the road. Two other projects, again, Bustang, such a neat um, new program in this region where, again, these long VMT trips, so coming from the springs across interregional trips that used to be many, many miles on the road in single occupancy vehicles. Now there's this great option to avoid congestion. Even if that bus taking those 20 people or 50 people, 50 vehicles off the road may not be doing the most to alleviate congestion. Those people that are sitting there and working on their computer or playing on their phone instead of experiencing that congestion is such a great resource. Another great project, this TransSuite traffic control system, which is a partnership between Lakewood, Denver, CDOT, um, you know, these long corridors, being able to signal time, um, adjust to um, incidents and coordinate um, throughout the region that helps alleviate congestion without adding new capacity and just using the facilities we have. There's a, another the list in, in the report that highlights some other projects as well. Um, so, you know, we're highlighting, especially as we've gone through the, the greenhouse gas um, planning process this year, that we, we expect significant increases in congestion here. Um, but, you know, we can mitigate that. We can work together with these, with these programs, uh, maintaining the telework that we've um, developed um, and effective planning. So our new plan really highlights even more projects that we've found that not only reduce GHG emissions, uh, which was our, our main target there, but through that planning, we've we found that those those the results of that planning work have also decreased future levels of congestion in our in our modeling, um, and and the GHG analysis just it made it clear that you know there's no silver bullet here. It's just going to take an extensive and diverse portfolio of all your work together to um, to, to attempt to mitigate these severe effects of congestion. And I think that's all I have. Here's some cool projects we do. Thank you, Mr. Spots. Do we have any questions or comments?
Seeing none, uh, thank you very much. We'll move on to um, our next informational item. Uh, no, item number nine, Regional Transportation Operations and Technology. I'll be Greg McKinnon. I am not Greg McKinnon. I am Steve Cook, and I will kick this off just for the first couple of slides here, um, just to kick things off. One thing to point out is this is just informational today, as noted. Next month is when there will actually be action uh, on this document in terms of making a recommendation um, to our other uh, Dr. Cog committees. One thing we really stress with the, the Regional Transportation uh, Operations and Technology Program is each of these words is really important. Um, the regional aspect to it, so the day-to-day -day operations of this system, it's really regional. It's all of your organizations have different things that you do to operate the transportation system every single day. And it's multimodal transportation. It's not just roads and traffic signals. And there's a lot of other things that have to do with uh, multimodal services, whether it's transit services, the dispatchers who are out there, uh, the drivers who are driving uh, various types of transit vehicles, human service transit vehicles um, is very important. It's that operational stuff, and that's one thing we try to stress, you know, like to get to the general public realizing, you know, it's thousands of people that are working on our transportation system every, every day. You don't even realize it, how many people are doing different things to provide these services to the public uh, to try to keep the system reliable so you can get from place to place, get to work, get to school, get to, get to healthcare facilities, whatever it is. The technology piece, that's a piece of it. But through this all, technology is a tool. You know, it's not the answer. Uh, it's something that can help enhance some of the day-to-day -day operations that are going on uh, for all these different mo modes. Why is it important? You know, we have over 15 million person trips a day. That's trip made by anybody who's walking, driving, bicycling, micro mobiliating. No, that doesn't make sense. If it's scootering, whatever it is, 15 million of these. 13 million are in a vehicle as either a driver or uh, as a passenger. A uh, couple million bicycle pedestrian trips are made. Uh, out of those 13 million uh, trips in motor vehicles, uh, that's actually in-person trips within the vehicles. That's 10 million vehicle trips a day. You know, traveling, as we just saw in the VMT report, approximately 85, 86 million miles uh, per day. You know, many of which are that CV there is commercial vehicles. You know, all those deliveries that are coming to you, especially this time of year, a uh, vast majority of those are being delivered uh, via a motor vehicle. Um, uh, many hours of, you know, quote, extra congestion per day, as was just noted uh, in the previous uh, presentation. One of the big things that uh, relates to the reliability of the system are the crashes and incidents that occur every day. Um, obviously, the loss of life and injuries is by far the most critical piece, most critical factor in these uh, crashes, but they also you know, cause greater amounts of uh, uh, unreliability on the system on a day-to-day -day basis. With that quick introduction there, I'm now going to turn it to Craig McKinnon, who's a lot smarter than me on the technical aspects, and let him talk about uh, the plan, the strategic plan. Thank you, Steve. You stole my thunder where I could claim that I am Greg McKinnon. Um, yeah, I would, we, this slide here is showing that we're, we're not starting from scratch. There's significant technology that's already been deployed, uh, more than 4,000 signals across the region and most of them connected uh, to a signal control system. Uh, and that, that number uh, is even higher when we just consider the regional roadway system. Um, the, the transit side of things with the 136,000 bus and rail service hours, or service miles, 
Um, but associated with that is the automatic ve automated vehicle location uh, data collection, along with passenger counting uh, devices on the vehicles, so we're aware of where the vehicles are and the passenger load in a real-time basis. There are over 1,700 traffic cameras. Uh, those are the cameras that allow operators to view what's happening on the roadway in real time. Um, the 200 intersections with bicycle detection is a growing number. Uh, what, what that does is allow uh, operations of individual intersections to be more efficient uh, in being able to provide spe a special phase for uh, bike operations uh, instead of having to um, keep it in recall is, is what they say, uh, just always calling up the, the, um, the, 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 um, the cross street phase to allow the bicycles to get through. And then all of this is supported by hundreds of miles of uh, fiber optic communications, a really robust uh, communications device. Um, the, this, I'm sure you all remember back in April when I was uh, here and uh, provided uh, an overview of what we were doing with the strategic plan. Um, the, this is just a, a reminder of, of what, what we did. Um, we were starting with the, the Metro Vision uh, goals and, and objectives, uh, and also influenced by the Mobility Choice Blueprint, uh, which was focused specifically on the application of technologies. And together, we, uh, with those, we developed uh, vision and goals and objectives, which we uh, sorted out with the, the Regional Transportation Operations Working Group. Uh, we also presented to the Advanced Mo Mobility Partnership uh, and uh, this group. Um, then using that and trying to achieve the objectives, we described an operational concept, uh, which is just a definition of all the roles and responsibilities of the partner agencies in the region on how we're going to achieve those objectives. And I use that term operational concept because it's specifically related to the regional ITS architecture that's being developed in parallel with this. Uh, that document is a federal requirement that we have to provide uh, at, at the regional level. And so this is where the two uh, documents are linked. But based on the operational concept, uh, we developed a set of regional initiatives uh, looking for, well, where, where do we have gaps? What are we missing? And, and being able to um, uh, move closer to achieving our objectives. And the whole purpose, uh, one, of, well, one of the main purposes of the strategic plan is to uh, provide the basis for our uh, set aside call for projects that will be coming early next year. And I note there that there's at least $16 million over the four-year period that we're looking to uh, allocate in, in that process. So um, the, the vision uh, that, that we have is here, I won't, won't read it word for word, but it's promoting interconnected collaborative operations. Uh, we're looking for safety, reliability, and efficiency in our operations, which means you know, we're talking about working together to provide uh, good service for all of the uh, travelers in our region. Uh, the goals are safe operations, efficient, seamless travel, and that's between modes and between jurisdictions. Trip travel time reliability for all travelers uh, in the region. And then we have our equity and environmental uh, goals that we mentioned as well. So that's stuff that you've seen before. Uh, the objectives that come out of that are, you know, the will um, come the performance measures that will guide, you know, our our the measures of our success for for how we're for performing. So we're looking to improve safety and uh, reduce crashes, fatalities, and injuries. The number one priority. Uh, for um, all things that we do operations-wise. We want to improve transit operations performance. Uh, largely, it's uh, the on-time performance is a, would be a focus there. Improve uh, operator and traveler decision-making capabilities. Um, and we'll get to you know, like the specifics of what that means. Um, the improve air quality and reduce transportation-related emissions. That's uh, a goal of, of this program ever since it was conceived for the traffic signal system improvement program uh, over three decades ago. Uh, and then increasing the trip travel time reliability for all travelers. It is a goal, but it's also a measurable objective, so that's why we have it listed here. 
want to minimize the travel delay due to system operations and disruptions, so basically making sure that we're doing our job well and not impeding any of the operations. Um, and part of that will be maximizing the operation infrastructure reliability and availability. If you have um, pieces of equipment in your system that are uh, failing often and take a long time to repair, uh, that will uh, cause problems uh, in, in a much have a greater impact than just the local uh, situation, the, um, the equipment. And then the rest are, are focused on uh, safety, again, uh, uh, related to the incident management program uh, led by CDOT. For the, uh, reduce the average incident duration and, and disruption, uh, the occurrence of secondary incidents, um, which is a, a measure you know, based on the duration of, a, of an incident, the longer it lasts, the greater chance of a secondary incident. So that, that's why we're trying to clear the incidents more quickly. And then I, a, a new big goal that CDOT identified is reducing responders struck by incidents. Uh, and, and so I note those related to the CDOT uh, traffic incident uh, management program. That's where they came from. but. Best practices on the freeway are still going to be best practices on the arterials. So it's something that we were looking to uh, uh, promote at a, at a regional scale. So as noted in the memo that we, you know, uh, the, the plan, the strategic plan itself, you know, looks at the current situation and then uh, we are um, uh, developing a set of needs based on that, comparing it with the uh, operational concept and the objectives that, that we're looking to achieve. Uh, and then developing an action plan. So I just wanted to show here is kind of a very simple um, uh, illustration of what we're talking about. The, the diagram on the left with the brown dots is showing where we have arterial traffic cameras currently. And so you can easily see that there are some places where it's very darkly covered and other places where it is uh, sparsely covered. So that's identifying places where we have physical gaps in, in the information and knowledge that, that, that um, the operators are able to use. The other diagram is, is showing our coverage of the, the traffic signals across the region. Um, but on top of that, you can see the different shades of colors showing that we have different systems controlling uh, neighboring uh, um, traffic signals. And so that will be one of the challenges that we have in terms of being able to have uh, integration and collaboration between our jurisdictions is having to, to uh, deal with uh, different, uh, different native systems. So in terms of the action plan, I wanted to start here because the base, the foundation uh, to be able to have uh, collaborative, collaborative strategies across the region is data and information sharing uh, between our, our jurisdictions and our modes. The green boxes are, are the, the focus. Um, the, the, I'll start with the, the regional multimodal travel information platform is uh, where we are going to be collecting data and, uh, and processing it and being able to distribute it to our travelers so that they have a better sense of, or, or have an improved capability to making good decisions uh, for them uh, through, to be able to move throughout the region. Uh, similarly, the situational awareness platform is to give the operators a more robust and more regional uh, perspective on the state of operations at any given moment so that they could uh, make good operations decisions in real time, and that's uh, 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 very specific to the emergency operations staff or traffic agents and management staff uh, to be able to coordinate uh, in the field and between jurisdictions. And then finally, the performance monitoring data archive platform is where we use the data to have a better sense of the optimization of uh, how our, our our operations are going and looking to what, what needs to be improved uh, over time, looking for bad trends that we need to have corrected. So um, the reason I, I, I went through that, that um, slide was to show uh, when we do move on to these initiatives here that the platforms are incorporated into it. So the very first one is the situational awareness uh, platform. Uh, the, and this first group is foundational to be able to support the sub subsequent uh, initiatives that in the secondary and tertiary groups. Um, but this is, these are the primary uh, elements that we're looking to be able to coordinate uh, the, the jurisdiction of operations 
and provide collaborative uh, strategies. So camera control sharing, uh, the camera systems in the region are right now not well integrated and, uh, and the ability to be able to share between jurisdictions, share control between jurisdictions and even between departments uh, is, is not available. So that's looking, something that we're looking to improve. Um, expanding the traveler data collection and surveillance systems. So that was uh, related to the left graphic that I was showing that we have gaps in, in, in the region for physical information uh, is that, we, that we're looking to get. Uh, the other platform, the performance measures uh, data platform, is something that we need uh, uh, right away to be able to understand the trends that we're, uh, we're facing and be able to um, uh, make good decisions on how to make um, optimization decisions there. And then based on that, well, that uh, basically that's what I described in the next bullet, the strategies and processes to collaboratively manage. Uh, we, we need, once we have the information uh, from a performance measures perspective, we can make performance-based decisions uh, as a region in terms of our operations. We want to improve the traffic incident management operating procedures. Uh, that's how do we work together, coming up with a set of standard operating procedures, but also integrating the computer-aided dispatch of the um, call centers with the traffic management centers so that they, they both have an awareness of, of, of each other, so knowing where the incidents are from the traffic management perspective and from the, um, the CAD, the computer-aided dispatch perspective, they know what traffic problems there are to be able to route uh, their vehicles uh, more effectively to uh, incident scenes. And then the traffic uh, transit signal priority optimization procedures, something that's already ongoing, uh, but uh, we have the transit signal, transit signal priority um, already deployed in the region in a few locations. Uh, and it needs to be co the coordinating data between uh, RTD and the local jurisdictions, the traffic signal systems, so they can understand that the system is working uh, optimally. And if it's not, how do we correct it? Secondary tertiary here are, the, you'll see in the document, are uh, following on and building on that foundation. Uh, the, the highlights, I would say, is the evacuation planning is something that came specifically out from the wildfires that we experienced in this region uh, just about this time last year, right? Um, and um, uh, that was something that was noted from the transportation agencies that we weren't quite uh, sure about what evacuation planning that was in place and in being, you know, being able to work together to be able to uh, evacuate in those situations. Um, and then, you know, something to build from that is coordinating our travel information messaging. Uh, many of the jurisdictions have the availability to distribute information. We want to make sure that it is aligned and not, uh, not contradictory. Uh, work zone monitoring and, and coordination is uh, for uh, roadway work zones, um, make, being able to make sure that they're safe uh, and that we're able to provide travel information to um, reduce any impacts, uh, con congestion impacts related to it. Uh, that the safety focused technology applications is, is a part of that, the part of the work zone uh, deployment, being able to monitor what's going on and share it with, uh, with the uh, community. In the tertiary group, uh, we're the, the regional multimodal traveler information platform is we, we, are, we have travel information out there already. This is a recognition that we need to uh, pull it together so that uh, multimodal uh, decisions can be made by the travelers instead of having to um, address um, several different travel information sources to make a, a, a formed decision. And the, the uh, multimodal trip planner and payment system that was identified in the Mobility Choice Blueprint it's something that would build directly off of that. So we'd have to keep building in, in each of these initiatives to get to something as complicated as the multimodal trip planner. Uh, the continuity of operations plans is, is an extension of the evacuation planning. There was one uh, TMC, uh, Traffic Management Center, that was taken down. Uh, so being able to address uh, a scenario like that is something that we build into it. So for all that, um, Get to um, you know the, the, the reminder or reiteration of, of what uh, Steve was saying. 
real-time data is essential uh, for the operations and being able to share it uh, is required for us to be, you know, uh, collaborative and integrate operations between jurisdictions. And as Steve said, technology is the tool. It's not the answer. Uh, it's more the strategies and the processes that we're looking for, but it'll, they'll be supported by these tools that we're looking to employ. Uh, we have to recognize that there are varying capabilities uh, and needs by jurisdiction. This isn't a, a universal solution. We need to be able to look in and address the needs of each of the jurisdictions. Um, and, and so that highlights that the regional management needed for uh, these key initiatives. And a lot of the key initiatives that I mentioned the, with the word platform at the end are the ones I'm referring to, but even just the development of our, our strategic operations uh, uh, coordination between jurisdictions. And that's where, you know, Dr. Cog continue to play a key role. Right now we provide uh, traffic signal timing um, support, uh, we call it now uh, the transportation operations uh, support services uh, for the um, for the system uh, going out and periodically doing retiming. But we could transform or evolve into a system where we're using the data that's coming in and providing uh, analysis and the very technical term of tweaking operations uh, for the, uh, the we're providing those recommendations for our, our partners here in the region. So that's my quick summary of the document that's in the packet for you to peruse. Um, uh, the, the, we'll be coming back again in January for action on the document, looking for a recommendation to get it through uh, RTC and the board. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Thank you, Doc, uh, Mr. Cook. Do we have any questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? No, this is very timely as there's a wildfire just west of Boulder right now. So we appreciate that. And that's why Alex Hydright had to leave. His home is in the evacuation area. So I just wanted to that out for Alex's sake. And if we can just send him our good thoughts, it'd be great. Thank you. Great. Griffith. Um, could you remind me about uh, 16 million allocated over four years? How is that spread out in the call, if I can't recall? It's going to be one call for the four-year period, and uh, we're looking to in initiate that uh, early in 2023. Um, because we're a set aside, we have some latitude of how that you know we could front load it, where a lot of projects or are, are, are activities are in the beginning, or more uh, putting more to the later years, which is, you know, I put that out there because that could be a, uh, a possibility because some of the, the more complicated projects that we're talking about have a foundation of more coordination efforts that could be funded in the early years and then looking to, to deploy later. So there's some flexibility in your request to spread it over the four years. Great, thanks. I think that would be good to help add a little more information in the packet when it moves forward up. Mr. Papsdorf. Greg, you take this plan to the Advanced Mobility Partnership. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, earlier when I, uh, we, we had um, uh, presented to this to, well, we worked with the, uh, uh, the Regional Transportation Operations Working Group, and uh, we have um, presented it to uh, the Advanced Mobility Partnership. But, we had also, um, when we completed a draft, distributed it to the members of both of those groups looking for comment. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's when we were ready to bring it to you uh, for uh, consideration. Thank you, Ron. No comments? All right, thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Cook. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call you doctor. <laughs> um, uh, that concludes all of our informational briefings. Uh, the informational item 10 is the fiscal year 2022 annual listing of obligated projects is in your packet. And if you have any questions, please do feel free to reach out to Josh Wink. Um, the final one, uh, final comment is administrative op, uh, items here, and we have the AMP working group update. Carson is not here, but I don't know. Do we have an alternate that is present here on the AMP that can give an update? 
Thank you. We'll uh, wait for an update in January. Um, Ron, I believe you have an update for us. Do just one item to note for the committee: um, the fiscal year 2023 raise grant program um, notice of funding opportunity was released by the U.S. Department of Transportation last week. Or so this is one of the um, several. Uh, federal discretionary grant or competitive grant programs uh, that are authorized in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, they did a call for projects last year. This is for uh, next year's. Uh, $1.5 billion is available for uh, funding across the country. Uh, they will award at least $75 million for eligible planning uh, proposals out of that program and at least $15 million for projects located in areas poverty or historically disadvantaged communities, um, as has become our practice for these major federal discretionary grant programs. We will send out more, more information to all of you and all of our local government partners, and we will be um, asking for that sort of short informational form for any of the agencies or jurisdictions in the region that may anticipate an application for the raise grant um, program similar to what we've been doing for uh, federal grant programs. So just look forward to that information here um, shortly before the end of the year and then we'll plan on asking for those forms to get back to us in time to just put in the agenda packet for the January tax meeting since that will be the last tax meeting prior to in advance of the of the deadline, which is the application deadline is February 28th, if I recall correctly. Thank you, Mr. Papsdorf. Any questions? Well, that concludes our agenda today. If you did not sign in, please do uh, sign in. Um, there is a sign-in going on around the room. And uh, thank you for your participation today in person. Our next meeting is January 23rd, 2023. We are now adjourned at 312. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy New Year, everybody.